Hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody who's uh, joining on the call today. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm from the Methanol Institute. I'm based in Singapore. I cover government relations and business development for the Asia and Middle Eastern regions. And uh, today I'll be your moderator for uh, today's webinar, which is focusing on renewable methanol. Um, so firstly, I would like to thank participants for joining the call today from wherever you are, whatever time, you're, time zone you're in. Uh, and we will be focusing on renewable methanol. We have presenters from four different companies uh, who'll be speaking about their individual experience in the country that they're operating in, and uh, also maybe give a bit of an insight as to what is the future of renewable methanol as a petrochemical or a fuel. Uh, so just a couple of things to note for housekeeping. Uh, everybody, if you're a participant, you're gonna be on mute. So uh, don't worry about muting yourself. Um, don't worry about trying to keep quiet. We cannot hear you at all. But because you are muted, um, there is only one way to sort of uh, convey your questions. And that's on the um, questions tab on your control panel on GoToWebinar. Um, so I would encourage everybody to um, submit your questions using um, GoToWebinar on that questions tab. It's a drop down menu. Just drop it down, uh, click on it, drop it down, uh, type your questions in, we'll, we'll be able to receive it. And uh, I'll be moderating Q&A when that starts. Also, you should see uh, in your GoToWebinar uh, control panel, there is a tab called Handouts. And under Handouts, you would see, if you click on it, uh, it should drop down to show you three different files. Uh, the three different files are firstly the presentation slides uh, from today's webinar but also two more uh, documents that were produced by Methanol Institute uh, on renewable methanol, and uh, I'll introduce you to them shortly. So uh, without starting, uh, I mean, without, without waiting, I will move ahead and uh, I'll, I'll give a short introduction before we kick off today's, webinars, uh, today's webinar with our participants. So uh, firstly, to start off, uh, Methanol Institute was established in 1989. It's been uh, more than 30 years right now. I was started in DC. Um, more than three decades later, we are the Tree Association for the Global Methanol Industry. Uh, we facilitate the expansion of the industry from uh, our headquarters in Singapore, but also our regional offices around the world in uh, Washington, DC, Brussels, and Beijing. So a bit of an introduction to us down there. This is what the membership in uh, MI looks like right now. We have a tiered membership. Uh, it starts uh, at the top uh, with our biggest producers. And then it trickles down to, um, say, the mid-size to smaller producers. But then also in tier four, you have some of these really, really interesting companies, which are technology providers. Some of them will be speaking in today's webinar. Um, they, they are technology providers for renewable methanol production. They could be manufacturers of uh, methanol fuel cells, uh, distributors of methanol, etc. So we do have a wide array of uh, members from different parts of the industry and they all come in on a single um, common interest uh, and that is methanol and that's also the focus of today's webinar. Uh, so just a bit of a elaboration on what MI does. MI um, focuses on the expansion of the methanol industry, but then we also have to address uh, methanol in the context of today, uh, which is 2020. Uh, and um, I wouldn't say that we're at the peak of uh, this trend um, to move towards sustainability, but I think we are building it and we're seeing um, this transition across different regions, across different sectors of business and industry. Um, and so I think, I think it would be prudent to talk about it or at least address that in this current context. Um, so MI supports, um, the spirit enshrined in the UN SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, but also the UN climate, uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, we do know and acknowledge that there is um, this transition towards a, a cleaner or low carbon future. Um, and um, in doing so, we, we focus on, on one single product, which is methanol. Uh, and in, in that we try to encourage uh, partnerships between public and private sectors to foster a greater sustainability, be it in the production of uh, methanol or even the utilization of methanol as a product, as a petrochemical or a fuel. Uh, beyond that, we advocate with different governments on the recognition of alternative fuels. There are uh, 
a couple of choices right now, actually, as, as we speak. And um, so methanol is one of them. But what we do is really to sort of advocate for a level playing field where uh, renewable or sustainable fuels and chemicals can compete with the more conventional ones. Uh, we do support a lot of technological development. Um, we do that through, for example, uh, today's webinar where we share information with uh, different stakeholders in the industry and um, we hope to uh, foster some kind of um, a, a culture of open uh, openness, transparency and collaboration between different stakeholders. Uh, I do have to note though, methanol is largely produced from natural grass at the moment, but that serves as an important starting point for the transition to clean and sustainable fuels uh, that can be used in both marine and land transport, uh, but also as a feedstock for uh, the greater petrochemical industry. So I think our presenters will cover this in greater detail, but I will just uh, highlight a couple of thoughts that I had when I thought about uh, renewable methanol and how I would like to introduce the subject. Um, Firstly, renewable methanol uh, lowers greenhouse gas emissions by using uh, carbon capture at industrial emitters and using that CO2 as a feedstock. Um, that's, that, that is crucial to the production of renewable methanol, uh, but methanol can be produced from other pathways, other feedstocks. More importantly, it can be produced, uh, or, or as importantly, it can be produced by waste. And in doing so, it diversifies uh, waste management in different municipalities by the diverting waste from landfills and incinerators to uh, creating something that is of value, something that, that, that can be used in the production of something that's useful. And that, that, that comes to my last point, which is value creation. Uh, when we talk about um, CO2, uh, normally we see it as a threat to uh, climate change, or uh, when we talk about waste, we see it as something that has to be disposed of. But the production of methanol uh, through renewable and sustainable pathways actually creates value from what we normally would deem as waste, uh, normally what we would normally deem as a threat to, say, climate change. Uh, so I think that's a, that's, a, that's an important point to note. And that certainly has not um, uh, been uh, ignored by governments. Actually, they, they have uh, recognized that there is value in um, producing uh, useful products from waste and, uh, say, for example, waste CO2. Uh, so in, in general, it encourages this carbon and waste circularity, which would go a long way in this uh, climate change mitigation conversation that we have all around the world today. So as I mentioned earlier, there are three handouts today uh, on your uh, go to webinar control panel. You can uh, feel free to download all three of them. The first would be um, the, the slide deck that will be used for today's webinar which will include the slides of every presenter today. But the other two uh, are an infographic. The first one's an infographic that's produced by Methanol Institute, which uh, looks at the different pathways to produce methanol, um, which includes renewables, and then also the, the ways in which methanol is being utilized uh, as a um, derivative chemical or as a fuel in a different uh, transport segment. Um, the other handout that's available for download today is the Renewable Methanol Report that was published by uh, Methanol Institute at the end of 2018. Um, it, it's um, been a while, but uh, it should still give you a good introduction to um, where we stand with the production of renewable methanol in um, different case studies around the world. So that might uh, also um, give you a better idea as to what's going on in, this, uh, in the renewable methanol uh, conversation or, or dialogue. So this will be my last slide. Um, this is just to introduce uh, Methanol Institute, where we're based, and also um, the different people that we you can get in touch with if you're in the relevant um, uh, region. Uh, but feel free to reach out to us either during the seminar by uh, putting up your questions or uh, reaching out to us by email uh, on any methanol-related questions, and we'd be happy to um, address them or put you in touch with somebody who could address them better. So. Without further ado, I would like to move on. Uh, I would like to introduce the first presenter of today, um, Dr. Thomas Cotter. He's from Clarin, uh, and he would be giving uh, his take and his experience, uh, or Clarin's experience, with uh, the production of renewable methanol. And um, so, Doc, Dr. Tom, I'll, I'll pass the time on to you right now. 
Thanks very much, Tim. And uh, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, also to the Methanol Institute for, for hosting us here today. I'm very pleased to, to join you all. Um, yeah, as, as Tim said, my name is Tom Carter. I'm a business development manager at Clarent, uh, working in PowerTX, and uh, includes, of course, renewable methanol. Uh, today, I want to talk to you a little bit about what Clarion's innovations in, in renewable methanol uh, catalysts are, but uh, also together with El uh, what we are able to uh, offer now with respect to a combination of catalyst and process. Maybe you could go to the next slide, please, Tom. Sure. So Clarion has quite a long history in, in what's uh, known here in Germany, especially as power to x and uh, power to x for us is, is really about enabling the use of green hydrogen in our economy. And this, of course, then deals with a, a number of different applications and you can see here from energy storage and transport to carbon capture and utilization and uh, various number of actual uh, process applications below that. And the end use, of course, varies, but there's a, a strong emphasis on, on transport and decarbonization of uh, areas such as aviation, uh, marine industry, and, and chemicals. But uh, common to, to every case, if you click once, uh, is the strong need for uh, partnerships. And technology licenses, including, including the end uses, uh, could you click once, please, Tim? Sure. So, uh, to, uh, as well as our core activities with Elekid uh, in methanol, we're also working with a number of other companies in, in power to x uh, In Aerotech, we are looking at uh, power-to-liquids uh, modular units. With ThyssenKrupp, we're uh, working on upgrading steel mill off-gas to chemicals and, and methanol. Um, Together with Audi and Hitachi Zosen, we've demonstrated the largest power to gas uh, commercial plant uh, globally. And with Hydrogenius, we have a, a very innovative catalyst and technology combination in the area of what's known as liquid organic hydrogen carriers for uh, distributed hydrogen. Could you go to the next slide, please? So here I've borrowed the, the scheme from the Methanol Institute, um, and this shows a little bit the pathways to biomethanol, uh, which can really come from a wide range of different feedstocks. So here one has the opportunity to use biomass, residues, forestry, uh, municipal solid waste, and then go via a, a range of different pathways, so fermentation, gasification, or uh, or pyrolysis, and uh, these, of course, then result in the syngas, which uh, needs to be upgraded and uh, then can be transformed to, to a methanol substrate. Um, of course, there are some issues here with a wide range of, of wastes uh, and, and biomass uh, substrates. We have then the challenges in upgrading the individual syngases. So there we see that there is a, a very big challenge in creating a clean syngas for, for these uh, processes, which adds, of course, to, to the cost of such processes. Another issue is that usually the available carbon to hydrogen is around uh, one to two coming out of, uh, for example, plastic feedstocks or, or, uh, or biomass. And this, of course, then leaves a significant amount of, of CO2 unused. Um, here, using power-based methanol production, we really have a convenient answer, I would say, for this, that we can take this unused carbon and uh, transform it to methanol in what uh, Clarient uh, strongly believes is the most efficient uh, approach to capture the carbon. So of, of many other uh, possible transformations for, for carbon dioxide, going via the methanol synthesis allows for the highest energy efficiency through the process. So we see power-based fuels are really a critical part of, of humanity's development. So 
they will need ongoing uh, supply of, of hydrocarbon fuels for for transport, uh, specific transport areas, as well as uh, chemical feedstocks, and as well as the increasing renewable energy uh, supply, we see an increased variability. And this variability is actually uh, something which can be addressed with uh, power power to X solutions and, and power to methanol in particular, because it allows us to store a variable energy, which we really need to do uh, in the future to be able to feed the global economy. If you go to the next slide, please, Tim. So what, what is Clarion doing about it exactly? And um, many of you, will, everyone will hopefully know that uh, Clarion is here very active in the development of methanol catalysts and uh, the technical support of uh, methanol production processes and syngas generation. Um, what you see here is something which looks quite typical, I would say, for uh, the activity curve for reformer conditions. But actually, this is the Megamax 800 catalyst from Clariant operating in pure CO2 conditions. So this data was achieved in Air Liquide's uh, pilot unit uh, in Frankfurt um, and demonstrated over 4,000 hours. And what it's allowed us to do is to take this data and create a model which then allows us to make catalyst designs for plants to run with constant uh, constant productivity and uh, with a lifetime of more than two years. So we have, in essence, a, a catalyst here which is demonstrated for CO2 and uh, a process which is matched to uh, to deliver a, a commercial CO2 performance. Of course, we would like to see longer lifetimes, and uh, one of the biggest issues here with regarding the CO2 conditions is really the large amount of water which is developed. This large amount of water creates a strong hydrothermal stress on the catalyst. Uh, so if you would go to the next slide, please, Tim. Just, okay. Um, so what we're doing here in our R&D is looking exactly this point on the hydrothermal stability. And our team has developed a new generation of methanol catalysts here, uh, one which is able to address the issues of hydrothermal deactivation, as well as that it is able to uh, show, demonstrate increased productivity and performance uh, in fresh state, which is shown with two aging steps here to only increase with the aging on stream. So this is, this difference in activity becomes more apparent with aging, which is critical for achieving the lifetime and having a designs which can have a maximized productivity. So what's next? We would like to uh, offer the opportunity for our, our customers to, to pilot this. And we'll be sampling in beginning of 2021, uh, offering this catalyst to uh, customers who would like to, to test it and give us feedback. And there we have, to summarize, a new generation of catalyst, which is designed for CO2, that can give the highest productivity over a lifetime, and will survive in new process designs more than four years. There may be the question then, what are these new process designs? And if we go to the next slide, Elikid has allowed us today to uh, to show you something which I find very cool. And on the left, you'll see here the current process technology, which is the classical recycle loop, and combined the existing state-of-the-art uh, methanol synthesis together with Clarion's catalyst, we can show stable performance uh, with CO2 and process stability. However, we are looking for the future here, and so what Elikid has been working on and is uh, able to demonstrate 
is a new process based uh, on a multi-stage approach. This multi-stage approach has individual reactors which have a condensation of water after each reactor. And then this is all operated on a recycle loop. The strength in this innovation is that it allows water to be condensed regularly out of the overall synthesis and the water which the catalyst sees is much less. This really enables the thermodynamics. So when you have a very, very high concentration of water in the synthesis, then it slows the catalyst performance and it also contributes strongly to the hydrothermal aging. So by regularly being able to remove the water from the process, then we enable the catalyst to have a, a much higher productivity and also a much longer lifetime. But what I find the most compelling aspect of this process innovation is that by integrating these, uh, these condensers, these reactors, and having a very clever approach to the technology, Elikid has managed to reduce the overall costs by 20% of the, of the plant costs. And this is, I think, uh, a very important aspect and one which we see in the economics, ultimately, of the power fuels. Go to the next slide, please. So a cost breakdown of any sustainable fuel will naturally reflect the various operating costs and capital expenditures. And here we see that uh, in a techno-economic case study, current costs of, uh, of methanol given the right conditions with, uh, with reasonable renewable electricity costs would come in at around 150 euros per megawatt hour. This of course is on the high end uh, when we compare it to advanced biofuels. However, by improving the cost positions in these critical investments, including methanol synthesis, as well as an increasing availability of renewable energy, then the next generation of catalyst and reactor technology from Elikid and Current would see fuel costs approaching closer to 100 megawatt euros per megawatt hour. And here we are much, uh, we are very much more competitive in the area of, of advanced biofuels. And this is relevant because the market for advanced biofuels is already existing in the United European Union. And this is based on a mandate for a renewable transportation, a portion of renewable transportation fuels set in the Renewable Energy Directive. And this uh, subsidizes or uh, encourages uh, nation states in the European Union to uh, include advanced biofuels as an increasing percentage every year in the total energy mix. However, these advanced biofuel costs vary widely depending on the technologies and also on the available feedstocks. So it's very foreseeable that the demand for these low carbon fuels will exceed the available supply of low cost biofuel sources within this decade. And using the process innovations and efficiency gains, I think there is a strong argument that power-based methanol can be an attractive investment and competitive with advanced biofuels within the next five to 10 years. Go to the next slide, please, Tim. Sorry. So finally, there are opportunities in renewable methanol. The first is that the catalyst and process for CO2 conversion is a reality. We can offer solutions depending on the needs flexibly for either existing plants or for new processes. There is a very good perspective for improved process economics. So our catalyst technology has evolved. We can boost the overall productivity of a plant. We can boost the lifetime of the catalyst. And together with this fantastic process from Elikid, 
that can enable standard catalyst lifetimes with, uh, I would say, unbeatable cost savings and energy efficiency for a power to X solution. And so with this, I hope everyone can now see that there is a profitable path to renewable methanol and that it can compete with biomass derived fuels. And one very important aspect here, which has been touched upon, is that this is a very uh, applicable turnkey solution. When we look at the, the inlet required, there's no syngas generation or upgrading. The byproduct make is very low, reducing the separation costs and creating a very high quality end product. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your uh, patience and attention. And uh, we welcome any questions later in the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. We will be having Q&A at the end of the webinar, so we will go through um, all the presentations uh, with uh, our remaining three presenters. And uh, I see that we are already getting questions. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm keeping track of them. And uh, when it comes to Q&A, we will address them. So next up, uh, I would like to invite, uh, actually, I would like to introduce our next presenter, uh, Yawa Abbas Nakfi from Haldo Topso. And uh, he would be sharing Haldo Topso's experience with methanol and also the production of uh, methanol from renewable sources. Uh, so Yawa, the floor is yours. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for your introduction. And I, I would like to thank Methanol Institute as well uh, to give Halotopso the opportunity to talk on this forum. Uh, as Tim introduced, I'm the business development director for Halotopso, focusing on power to x solutions, which include methanol. And for us today, I would be sharing Topso's insights on how we see the future, both near term as well as long term, for producing sustainable methanol. It's going to take some time. Maybe, Tim, you can handle the slides to. Sure, I'll do it. To, yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Yes, uh, to begin with, I would actually like to have a short introduction about Halotopso. Halotopso, uh, to those who know, or, or to companies who doesn't know, we are a private owned company established back in 1940 with our headquarters in Lumbi, Denmark. Since our inception, we have been always a uh, market leader in heterogeneous catalysts for various applications in the refinery as well as chemical industries that's been listed uh, on this slide. We are offering full range of uh, products and services to our customers throughout the life cycle, right from uh, process licensing to high performance catalysts, uh, to the proprietary equipments and uh, business and technical services pre and post uh, of the project life cycle. We are uh, we having a global presence with more than 14 sales offices, four engineering offices, two R&D centers, and two catalyst production sites across four continents. Uh, of these two catalyst sites, we have one close uh, to Denmark in Fredrikson, and the other one is in Houston, US. Topso actually spends uh, around 9% of our revenue uh, towards R&D to actually strive achieving the vision set by our founder, Dr. Halo Topso, to make this world a better place to live. So maybe maybe to the next slide. So when we are talking about, uh, you know, how can we how can we contribute to make this world a better place to live? We see normally two key trends that are currently. Uh, one is a push towards uh, decarbonization and the other one, uh, a global push towards electrification. Uh, and if I have to further elaborate these, these two trends can be then translated into three sides of a triangle which are interlinked to each other. The first ones are the, electro, the environmental drivers, where there is a need to reduce CO2, control the air pollution, and also address the water scarcity problem in general. Whereas uh, the second push is coming from all the policymakers or the state governments, uh, where they have been a general consensus that have been made on the individual country level as well as on the global level, as uh, Tim also mentioned with the, uh, with the Paris Agreement from 15, where a lot of suggestions have been made or promotions of use of renewable technologies by subsidizing the project or imposing 
energy targets for the fossil based projects or imposing taxes on these emissions. Whereas the third element where we actually see and TOPSO contribute significantly is benefiting the development and the improvement on the technology side. Uh, what we are also seeing is the intermediate enablers uh, towards these trends, so, such as renewable energy technologies uh, for PVs or wind turbines or uh, hydro turbines or the batteries, for instance, the cost of these uh, technologies are falling significantly in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, whereas uh, the ammonia, methanol, or hydrogen energy has taken uh, a big drive uh, towards uh, potential energy with energy use of use as an energy vector or fuel uh, using the existing infrastructure. So for our discussion today, uh, let's look at the methanol production and how we can achieve the sustainable production both short term as well as uh, uh, near term and long term. And next slide, please. So, so let's have a look. How can we make methanol uh, today? Ninety-five percent of the world methanol is produced using fossil based based stock. It can be natural gas or coal, often referred as grey methanol, where the typical CO two emission is around or to to an extent of around 0.3 tons of CO two per ton of methanol, which can be achieved. Another route where methanol could be produced is combining the use of fossil fuel together with the renewable energy or capturing the CO2 from the process and re-injecting into the process. This concept uh, is also in the industry referred as blue methanol. It's a well-proven concept, had been uh, you know, applied in the industry for, for some years now. Uh, but is lately getting traction from the market. Here we have the possibility to design the process to achieve the desired level of emission uh, target, keeping the commercial viability of the project. Uh, whereas there is uh, another route, which is also the green route, which is completely based on renewable feedstock. Uh, and the building block for the renewable feedstocks are well proven on the individual level and have been demonstrated successfully for what we call a small or mini scale. Uh, for the large commercial capacities, uh, the economics have to be tested. However, since everything is based on renewable feedstock, uh, you can actually achieve a net uh, uh, negative CO2 emission, meaning you actually are consuming CO2. So if you go to the next slide. So out of these three options, if we see what can drive the whole economics towards e-methanol or uh, a sustainable methanol, uh, we, would, we would say we have to look beyond the current applications of methanol being used. Uh, we all know methanol is used as an intermediate feedstock for chemical production. Uh, a complete decarbonization of the value chain will definitely drive towards uh, e-methanol production or sustainable methanol. Another application where we see e-methanol would play a role would be used as a transport fuel. Either you directly use it as transport fuel or indirectly by further downstream processing to run ship, trucks, and airplanes. Uh, whereas uh, e-methanol also has a huge potential to, to be used as an energy carrier or uh, power storage medium for long term. Uh, so all, all in all, e-methanol can actually be a, a good uh, stream uh, to actually get the greenhouse gas reduced uh, in the various sectors. Next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, what we call e-methanol. E-methanol is a topso trademark uh, process which is basically based on non-fossil productions of methanol, but also include hybrid and fossil based plants. So what you are seeing here are typical, uh, typical routes of producing e-methanol, meaning taking power, renewable power, converting it through electrolysis to get the hydrogen, whereas capturing CO2 from air and getting the methanol out of it you can also get, you can use biomass or 
use using the gasification route, or you can actually also do the fermentation, make a biomass, and then use our uh, also innovative solution of ESMR to correct the gas composition that goes into the methanol production to make it economical. So these are some of the routes that we see uh, uh, applicable for green or uh, green e-methanol production. To the next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so let's let's look at uh, you know one of the aspects of the different components that you have in the e-methanol, uh, and we would like to focus on consideration on designing the synthesis section, which also includes our proprietary MK317 sustain catalyst. Uh, what is important is uh, we will design. We see that there is no need to design the methanol synthesis section differently. It will be the, the the loop will be similar to what we designed today with the traditional uh, for the traditional plant. But the main difference is to actually understand the reactivity of the gas uh, uh, because if you think about hydrogen and CO2, uh, pure CO2 gas, this will be less reactive. Uh, and if you if you see the slide, which is uh, the, the the reactivity of the gas going from zero to hundred, this is what we normally refer uh, as a ratio of carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide, uh, which determines the gas reactivity. Typically, for a steam methane reformer, the reactivity is around three, uh, whereas for our simple process. Uh, it, it's the reactivities are on five, and if you look at the coal-based plants, uh, you probably you have uh, you have higher proportion of carbon monoxide and very low content of CO2, which makes the reactivity quite low towards them. When we are talking about green or sustainable methanol using only hydrogen and CO2, the reactivity is on the other end, which is quite low. If you look at the graph, uh, we have tried to plot these graphs against the reaction rate versus the reactivity of the catalyst, what you can see uh, from the graph is that uh, the blue line, which represents uh, a process based on syncor gas, uh, has a higher activity than, uh, than, than the red line, which is uh, a gas that contains a piece of just hydrogen and CO2. Uh, and the reactor, uh, the way we see is that uh, the reaction rate difference is around three to seven times, which means that you would need much more catalyst uh, if you have to design a process gas based on pure CO2 and hydrogen. Furthermore, what is important uh, is to understand the CO2 stability and mechanical strength of the catalyst. As Stopso is both the technology licensors and the catalyst supplier for many years, we have uh, the reference for running on a similar feedstock of high CO2 rich gas equivalent to what we would normally see on a, a CO2 plus hydrogen gas for more than 20 years. So not only on the pilot scale, but actually in, in an actual, uh, actual running plant where the composition is similar. And based on that, uh, we have further developed and come up with our innovative MK317 catalyst, which uh, meets the today's standard requirement of, uh, of, of the catalyst uh, that you look for in a conventional plant. Uh, maybe the next slide, Jim, please. Uh, in, in, so, so we'll just share one of the projects that we are working on, on the green uh, methanol concept, which is a liquid wind project where we, are, uh, where we see a sustainable methanol project uh, uh, being developed using uh, carbon captured from paper and pulp industry and hydrogen from the volatile electrolysis based on our e-methanol technology and uh, MK317 sustain catalyst. The project is anchored towards local community with the renewable power, uh, local industries, and has a Swedish framework for all the offtakes. Uh, I think so Tim can, can, can also, the uh, liquid bin was being presented at one of the webinars sometime 
ago. So we are part of this strategic project together with uh, other partners who are providing solutions to this project. Further to that, let us share uh, uh, from our perspective a case study that we have actually done for the hybrid concept as well, uh, so that we can we, we can look at from both the aspects. What can we do, uh, you know, in the current state, as well as where the where the complete green methanol could make a commercial sense. So we have a customer that we have worked together in Europe to look at the commercial attractiveness of both hybrid concept as well as uh, completely uh, green, uh, completely uh, e-methanol concept of producing based on CO2 and hydrogen feedstock. Uh, so, what, so the process scheme that you see uh, actually is utilizing the natural gas, uh, having an SMR and uh, our single reactor uh, in, in addition to that, there is an electrolyzer which feeds in the hydrogen and oxygen to the process and the flue gas from the fire heater uh, and the SMR uh, is captured to be injected back into the synthesis gas process. So what we have seen uh, is, is quite a good uh, uh, feeling around that the electrolyzers that we have used for both this uh, for both the cases for hybrid as well as uh, the 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 complete green because it is the same size whereas the carbon capture was uh, size was used as a standard unit uh, to the desired amount of co2 needed to produce uh, the, the methanol uh, whereas in a hybrid plant you would you would you would have a natural gas uh, front end whereas you don't have that uh, front end for the you know, for the CO2 and hydrogen based plants. What we can see as a difference is to, to both both these both these plants have negative carbon emission, meaning uh, we are able to to have the net CO2 consumer rather than exporting or or having some positive emissions. Uh, the what is interesting uh, from the study that we did was the break even price for the methanol. We see that uh, for the hybrid plant, which is able to produce 1,000 tons per day of methanol, uh, is having uh, a price that is very close to the current methanol price that you see in the market. So, so, so if you would imagine a region where the natural gas prices are even lower, uh, uh, you can you can always imagine that in these countries, uh, it's even more bankable. Uh, and make it more interesting for the investors uh, to, to get a similar ROI as they would do for a conventional methanol production and also achieving a negative uh, CO2 emission uh, for, for the project. Uh, next slide. So to conclude uh, my presentation, I would, I would just emphasize that Topso brings the wealth uh, of our competencies for commercializing renewable technologies. Here are some of the highlights that's been listed. Topso has more than a decade experience uh, putting our active uh, research and development activities in understanding the water and CO2 electrolysis towards development of our fuel cell technology, uh, we have experience working in more than three projects, uh, 20 pre or project development across various renewable technologies. Topso has more than 50% market share in renewable diesel, whereas more than 50% of ammonia or 30% of methanol uh, in the world is produced using Topso solution. Uh, it's not only on the project development side, we are also part of strategic project uh, like Sky, RNG or Rock biofuel projects where we have actually demonstrated that commercializing these renewable, uh, you know, renewable projects using our technology and catalyst on large scale. And you must have heard with the recent announcement done by uh, Air Products, Neom and Aqua Power for the Helios project where Topso uh, is partner providing our technology and catalyst to the ammonia synthesis section. Uh, so what, what we can say is please look out for us 
we will be sharing more updates and news on our development that we are doing on the e-methanol concept uh, on liquid wind projects, but some of the other projects that we are working to closely with our customers. Uh, you can get these information and updates on our uh, blog. Uh, the uh, e-methanol block, we, we, the link to these block is on the last page of our presentation, which you may have downloaded uh, from the uh, from the link that Methanol Institute has given. But also, if you you can also download it later on after the presentation. I think so that's all from my side. Uh, thank you all for listening. I will be very happy to address your question and answers. Uh, and Tim mentioned that these question and answers will be towards the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, you can contact us also directly by contacting alitopso.com. Thank you. Thanks, Yawa. Um, so next up, we have uh, Stan Ronick. Stan Ronick from um, BSE Engineering. Uh, so I'm not gonna keep you waiting. Uh, Stan, why don't you uh, take the floor? Thank you, Tim. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the invitation to hold the presentation. The Methanol Institute has done so much for the methanol industry. Recently, we were working together uh, on fuels for passenger cars, maritime, and in the standardization of methanol. So uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, we were asked uh, to speak about the legal about uh, acceptance in the market, technique, and a little bit about the pricing. We are based in Germany, so I focus on the European uh, legislation. Uh, we have uh, set the targets uh, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and we failed only in one sector which is the transport fuel sector. Uh, uh, in the last review, we had uh, 143 million tons of CO2 equivalent, too much emissions per year. So the uh, ambition is to reduce these emissions. And uh, in the decarbonization, we have basically uh, two legal frameworks. It's the emission trading system. There um, was included uh, the obligation of the industry and uh, the uh, power uh, producers to reduce their CO2 emissions. And the industry became uh, or received the option uh, to produce uh, products in Europe which are in competition uh, globally and uh, uh, develop uh, to uh, produce uh, um, with uh, fewer emissions. This continues uh, since the first phase. In the phase three, uh, the carbon capture utilization became a topic on member states level. Uh, we had during this uh, phase, the judgment Schaefer Kalk uh, uh, versus Germany, there was for the first time the acceptance of this utilization in the monitoring report. And uh, with the Act Solvay against Germany, there we had the acceptance uh, of transferred CO2 as no emission in the monitoring report. And in the current phase, uh, which is adopted and uh, under implementation, we will see uh, impacts out of uh, this uh, jurisdiction uh, European-wide. Uh, the second framework is the renewable energy and fuel uh, regulations. It started with the Renewable Energy Directive and Fuel Quality Directive. There were introduced uh, the greenhouse gas methodology, methodology for biofuels. This uh, continues since then. It was uh, adjusted to achieve a uh, um, high degree of sustainability. And since the amendment of the two uh, regulations and directives, we had uh, the introduction of e-fuels, which are currently now under clarification regarding the CO2 and power source. The, so-called uh, Renewable Energy Directive 2 starts next year and should be 
under implementation of each member states. So uh, on the left side, I have uh, written some general trends which uh, uh, apply for the coming decade. Uh, out of this, we see um, uh, some mega trends which are partly outdated uh, within one day. I start with the last uh, renewable energy source and hydrogen initiative. Uh, today, the uh, European Commission announced to increase uh, the target of 32% uh, cross energy consumption from renewables uh, uh, beyond that target. And uh, with the uh, Green Deal, we have a higher focus on hydrogen and the sector coupling uh, with hydrogen. So the other uh, mega trends that we see are low carbon economy. Uh, by 2030, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, shall be uh, cut by half. Then we have the circular economy, uh, which means that we uh, are going to landfill less waste and reuse the waste uh, as material and energetic wise. And uh, that we turn the byproducts uh, from one industry uh, to a uh, uh, resource for other industries. Then we have resource efficiency and the reindustrialization, and nowadays the green recovery, which means that uh, in the European Union we will build up green jobs as part of the uh, catching up after Corona. In Germany, the uh, Deutsche Bundestag has uh, estimated dem the demand of um, uh, green synthetic fuels and gases with a capacity of 15 to 45 gigawatt. Uh, recently, the National Hydrogen Initiative uh, has been uh, um, started, has started, and part of it is the installation of five gigawatt uh, generation capacity, including the wind farms. Uh, this will be uh, uh, producing uh, roughly 100 terawatt hours of electricity, which shall be used as fuel. Then we have the Fuel Emission Trading Act, uh, which brings uh, for the first time a CO2 price for fuels. Uh, uh, um, as heating fuel and in transport fuel. By 2026, uh, uh, there shall be implemented a market system where the price range shall be 35 to 60 euro per ton CO2. I have a little bit of a lag now. Uh, globally, we have also the acceptance uh, the Global Power Alliance said uh, that the technology power fuels is market ready and everybody will benefit from it. Uh, the countries that have the renewable energy sources, the producers and consumers. The uh, Power to X Alliance said uh, that this technology is a effective uh, climate protection and will benefit the industry policy. The World Energy Council said that power to x is an integral part in the global energy transition. So the conclusions uh, from our uh, side is that we have uh, uh, certain resources in abundance, which is uh, volatile renewable electricity and CO2. And the ways uh, to use this are battery, power to heat, power to fuel, power to gas, and power to cam. And we focus with methanol uh, uh, in power to fuel and power to cam. So how is the acceptance in the trans transport sector? Uh, 
first of all, uh, methanol is a liquid energy carrier. It's easy to store and comparing uh, one cubic meter of methanol, uh, it has the same energy amount, uh, like uh, 200, more than 200 uh, BMW i3 charges. Uh, methanol is already accepted uh, in the transport fuel market. Uh, it's conform uh, with the gasoline specification, so it can be blended directly. And as MTBE, uh, which amounts approximately 7% uh, methanol in the gasoline. Uh, there are additional applications for methanol in small quantities in fuel cell. It is already uh, um, used in the biodiesel production. So there is a demand which can be covered with renewable methanol and it can be upgraded to the diesel substitute DME. Uh, these are some pathways of upgrading methanol uh, in the transport fuel market. DME, olefin, gasoline, and OME. Everything except OME is state-of-the-art technology, industrial available. Not going further? No. Uh, with Daimler, we are uh, performing a project uh, to develop M100 engines in modern gasoline engines, uh, which uh, uh, where we see uh, the acceptance of uh, pure methanol as uh, uh, fuel in uh, plug-in hybrids and as, uh, uh, so to say, power-based uh, uh, cars driving with uh, liquid fuel. Another project where we are associated member is the uh, C3 Mobility. There the focus is uh, uh, derivates out of power-based methanol, like OME, DME, butanol, methanol to gasoline. So when we want to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in the existing fleet, uh, we can design the fuel and produce it out of power. So it's already now possible to reduce the greenhouse gas em emissions in the existing fleet. Uh, our experience from the ethanol industry was uh, that the automotive industry was not interested in changing anything. And this is now different with methanol. We have a strong commitment of the automotive industry in pure methanol engines and derivates from methanol. Next slide. Also in the uh, maritime industry, we see a strong commitment. Uh, the International Maritime Organization uh, just released the interim guidelines where methanol is accepted as bunker fuel. The European Union uh, starts a regulation where potentially we will see a blending mandate for the fuel switch uh, heavy oil to uh, uh, to clean fuels and synthesized hydrocarbons like methanol are in the focus the project mesa uh, ship came to the conclusion that methanol is the only option that is viable for for the uh, shipyard construct uh, the ship construction industry for different reasons uh, first of all methanol is globally available so in the switch to clean methanol 
we uh, are able to bunker uh, fossil methanol globally. And second, uh, methanol can be stored in the outer walls of the ships. Unlike uh, um, LNG, it must uh, be placed uh, inside, inside the vessel. Uh, so there's a big loss in cargo capacity. Okay. Uh, now I come to the technique. How does it work? Uh, we uh, can utilize every uh, CO2 source. Uh, can be air capture, can be clean CO2 from bio uh, gas or ethanol fermentation. But we can also go to industrial process. There we need a CO2 capture uh, to supply pure CO2 to the methanol synthesis. The hydrogen that is needed seems from an electrolyzer. And the both gases are mixed in the right proportion, converted in the methanol synthesis. An outlet is crude methanol consisting of methanol and water. In, uh, for this concept, we have uh, built up a uh, mini plant in Stralsund, Germany. There you can see again the principle. Uh, our feed gas is CO2 and hydrogen. And uh, roughly 15% gets uh, converted into methanol and the not converted gas is feed back together with the hydrogen CO2 stream. And ambition of the project is to gather long-term experience, what is the behavior of the catalyst. And uh, continuously, uh, we, uh, we sample the outlet and make an analysis. Here you can see one batch. And interesting is uh, that we have uh, no long chain hydrocarbons in the crude methanol. The other materials, ethanol, propanol, butanol, material formate, this will get distilled out. And remarkable is that the ethanol content already achieves the IMPCA specification. Okay, comparing to uh, mega methanol plants uh, producing like a uh, thousand tons per day, uh, our methanol units are small, converting approximately 20 tons per day upwards. And here you can see uh, it's small in the dimensions. And we have secured uh, the flexibility uh, with uh, different variability points and uh, have tested different catalysts to ensure that uh, there's no uh, uh, substantial degradation by the start-stop modus. The continuous distillation is secured by a, a buffer tank of the crude methanol, and also the distillation is state-of-the-art. Here you can see a two-stage distillation, and outlet is IMPCA quality. Okay. And uh, to market uh, our skids, which we developed as Flex Methanol 10 and 20 modules, we have founded the BSE Methanol GmbH. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us via this email address. Our modules are characterized uh, by these figures. So, for instance, the Flex Methanol 20 uh, is equivalent to 20 megawatt uh, connection uh, to the electrolyzer. It consumes roughly 24,000 tons of CO2 per year and produces 16,400 tons of methanol. The outlet 
of the oxygen from dialectolyze is 26,000 tons per year, and we have also usable waste heat. The process is characterized by mild process conditions, 40 bar pressure, 240 degrees zero, uh, degree C. We have secured uh, that there is no need for hydrogen compression. We have no separate reverse water gas shift reactor, and we use the proven catalyst of VSF. Because we use pure gases, we have also no solid waste like TARS. Okay, the price mechanism. This is very different uh, to methanol from natural gas or coal. Uh, we see the market uh, for the next 10 to 20 years in the transport, transport fuel market. And there we are able to achieve a premium price for the greenhouse gas savings. For instance, in Germany, we have a blending mandate in place and the mineral oil industry is obligated to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions of the fuel that they sell. If they don't comply, they have to pay a penalty of 470 euro per kilogram CO2 equivalent. And this can be prevented by blending in, so to say, greenhouse gas savings of a green fuel. Uh, when we consider the greenhouse gas emission savings of methanol, then we come to a premium of 831 euro ton. And additional to that, we have the energetic value. This is one way to calculate the value of renewable methanol. When we compare methanol with uh, existing products like biomethanol from biomethane, uh, we have to compete with this product. What is the cost price? We have a fixed price for the biomethane efficiency of 70%. So we come to a feedstock cost of 550 euro per ton, including the operational costs. We have a cost price for biomethanol of 700 euro per ton. So below this price, you will not see biomethanol on the market. Here you can see the interaction of fossil methanol with uh, the natural gas price. And this is not valid for renewable methanol. If you have any question about the pricing or if you want to create a business case together with us, feel free to contact us. Thank you, Stan. No okay, welcome. thank you. Was in the time. Yes, uh, so next up, uh, I'll be introducing Damien. Damien's from Orsted. He's the head of markets innovation. Um, so Damien, uh, we're kind of short on time, but I will uh, control the slides for you and um, you can start. Okay, so we're going to start an innovation journey now. We don't have to spend too much time looking at technical uh, uh, data. The preceding uh, speakers have covered that. So, so this slide here where right in the heart of a steamship. Um, it's pretty filthy, right? Um, but that's how we moved all our goods and services not, not so long ago. Um, if you move to the next slide, what, you know, we, we said, so based some of our inferences from, from the territories of, of where we're based, so, so I'm, I'm dialing in today from Denmark. And in, and in 1912, um, the uh, Selenia was the first ship to usher in bunker fuel. It was the first ship that sailed out of Kubanam Harbor over to Asia. Now, it, it was the first of its kind. Um, there was no bunker fueling around the world. The operators of this ship 
and the people that are looking at this ship would go, how's this going to work? How's this challenge going to work? How will we fuel it? Because we know where we will buy the steam coal from and we know how steam coal uh, vessels work. Well, since that vessel sailed, the industry never looked back. And that vessel has now been classified as a ship that changed the world. It, it ended a steam coal operation pretty much from, from that year. Um, we're going to change colours now as we go to the next slide uh, to look at a future where we look at cleaner fuels or something which I would call an electrofuel. And it's quite exciting to share this journey. Um, because this is where Erstel and its partners within transport are going to collaborate on how we can basically develop wind and solar and, and capture the CO2 to service road, uh, rail, uh, air and, and sea transport and, and pull all this together. So we would hope that this is a way of inspiring the world to understand that we can make a generational change to a new type of, of fuel. If we go to the next slide, I've been to so many conferences and, and meetings where people try and push the silver bullet, try and push, it has to be one solution. And let's be honest, that's because they're talking the economics of their technology or their business model. I don't think any of us lose any sleep when we turn up to a fueling station in our cars and see two nozzles. One of those nozzles is petrol stroke gasoline and, and the other nozzle is diesel. We don't lose any sleep about why somebody else has chosen diesel over petrol. It's a choice for use case. So when I look at how do we develop a world run entirely on green energy and focusing in on transport? Well, there are three major routes that we can use to decarbonize transport. Electrification, the biofuel route, and a number of presenters have, have talked today about how we can develop uh, uh, biomethanol and whether it's feedstock is coming from a, a you know, capture of CO2 or it's feedstocks coming from a uh, a waste source. When I talk to the industry and the methanol industry, I think the important thing to look at is e-fuel is not competition to displace existing. It is a way of delivering a new growth market. The biggest challenge we face today is we've got lots of goods that still need to move around. And they're going to move around by shipping, typically sea-based shipping. And that fuel today is heavy fuel oil. Um, but that fuel's an antique. You know, when we look at that, 1912 was the first, first vessel to start using this technology. So we're talking about in this, you know, modern age, we're using a fuel that's over 100 years old to move all our goods and services because we haven't yet found the right alternative. Now, the interesting feature is that we've seen a consensus across governments, industry participants, and most importantly, our consumers that are chasing a cleaner fuel. So if we consider you know, global shipping, 90% of it is fueled by heavy fuel oil, which is a bottom of the barrel remnant from the crude crack. It is a pretty, polluting fuel that we're utilizing and we need a lot of it we need 300 million tons of heavy fuel oil a year so when we look at methanol and methanol go oh um, electromethanol could be a competition for me i'm quite nervous i think if we embrace the challenge and say what we're disrupting as an industry here is we're disrupting heavy fuel oil for a for a cleaner fuel if we just jump to the next slide it really is very, very simple. We don't have to have PhDs in chemistry to understand how the electromethanol is produced. I'm not going to go into great detail because the presenters before have covered it, 
but it's pretty straightforward. We start off with whether it's solar, wind and water as the base energy. Now, when you look at the energy requirements to displace heavy fuel oil, when we look at, let's call it um, waste material, or, or you know, I'm talking the waste cooking oils here, the waste biomasses, um, or we start looking into the biofuel route, we don't have enough to replace heavy fuel oil. When we look at renewable energy from wind and solar, we have more than enough to cover that three, four times over. So there isn't an energy problem. When, when we consider how we then take that energy and turn it into a transport fuel, it gets really cool really, because you take your wind, you add some water, and you take a waste gas, which is your waste CO2, you know, biogenic or, or something come from an industrial gas. We, we combine that and that's as simple as that. We have a transport fuel. Um, are we talking about alchemy now? Are we talking about something that's very, very new? Well, I want to finish on two very, very uh, credible use case examples. So if we go to the next slide. So I jumped on a plane, landed in Reykjavik, and uh, Carbon Recycling International picked me up in one of those cars that you see there. And that car operates on 90% methanol, 10% diesel. Um, the 10% diesel there is, is required just to get the methanol up to temperature. Now, this isn't a, a, a fuel cell vehicle. This is a combustion engine. And Carbon Recycle International have been marketing this fuel that they call Vulcanol since 2012. So we have you know, a proven technology of where they can capture the CO2, uh, they can utilize the renewable uh, energy to create a tangible fuel. If we go to the next slide. So I was picked up in a, in a passenger vehicle. Um, but then we have to look at applications at scale at sea. And, you know, I just two examples there. Obviously, uh, Methanex are moving their methanol around using their shipping uh, 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 vessels, which is 55,000 ton dead weight. Um, uh, Stena Germanica is one of the world's largest uh, ferries, which has been operating on meth methanol since 2015. So we know we can produce it and we know we can utilize it and we know the engines work because there's a picture of two vessels that have plenty of in-service hours. So when I look at my final slide, um, the important aspect uh, for me is to bring something new to this, to, the, to this industry when we talk about an electro fuel and people talk about electrification. I think the important bit of what we want to do is we want a cleaner fuel. Is methanol cleaner than heavy fuel oil? Yes. Can methanol become lower carbon? Yes, because it's recycling carbon that it's taking. Can methanol be achieve a net zero? Yes, if it's the CO2 is captured from a biogenic source. And all of the speakers beforehand have talked through their technological solutions that can provide this. So the interesting aspect is when we look at methanol as an opportunity to invest into fueling international shipping well the timing's right because Maersk and the other lines have come to the come to the market and said we need a cleaner fuel and methanol has been identified as as one of those uh, solutions the technology is available as said and it's tangible and I think when we look at some of the customers that are looking for very, very green solutions, I think, you know, electromethanol is a great way of putting the wind back in the sails of the shipping industry. Um, so it's exciting to, you know, present to you guys today uh, to introduce you to how wind and solar can be part of methanol's next chapter and deliver a generational innovation. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Damien. So uh, we are running a little late, but we will still go on with uh, Q&A. Uh, 
what I did realize is that two of our presenters are based in Denmark and two of them are based in Germany. Um, so what we'll do is uh, let's try Denmark and Germany. Uh, let, let's talk about the experiences uh, from a regulatory front, but also from a business perspective. So I'll kick it off. Um, and, and, and since Damien, you're the last to present, uh, I guess this is to you and Yawa. Um, the Danish government just uh, announced uh, in, in a matter of less than a couple of weeks ago that they have came up uh, with a, a broad uh, consensus for a new green deal for Denmark, which will um, basically um, support the country's transition towards a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so let, let's bring it into context today. We're talking about methanol uh, and in your various uh, positions and companies, you do deal with uh, methanol to, uh, uh, to varying extents. What do you think uh, this new green deal that the Danish government has brokered would vote for uh, renewable fuels in general, but also uh, methanol in particular? Uh, maybe Damon, you can start first. Yeah, I think we have to go back to, um, I, I've been in energy for over 25 years. I have never, ever seen a global consensus across Europe and in other leading uh, countries around how to achieve net zero emissions. And that is the... Um, renaissance of an industry called hydrogen and clean hydrogen so you know europe has put out some very very bold targets of how hydrogen uh, can deliver you know the next generational fuels now that's fueling power stations that's fueling trains that's fueling uh, cars um the important aspect of when you look at how you carry the hydrogen. Gaseous hydrogen is great and there's a lot of uh, fantastic use cases, but to get the energy density and to make it um, tr transportable, you find two great carriers, ammonia and methanol. The cleaner aspect of clean air that we would see particularly in China without any form of subsidy you know they are looking at rolling out and utilizing methanol in passenger vehicles because it's clean burning the issue of co2 is not what they're addressing they're they're dealing with clean air when we look at europe um, and you know green deals as you've said the target is to look at how we can get to net zero that is a challenge um, for for methanol within these uh, nations so when you look at how methanol can't be can be used for, for net zero co2 within countries then you're focused on uh, the regulations regarding biogenic so anything which is got biogas or biofuel or um, a, a biomass capturing that co2 will deliver a net zero through the current accounting practices um, what, what I think is really interesting beyond what is mandated or pushed by, by governments, it is perhaps even more exciting to see industries, the shipping industry that has said they want to decarbonize. IMO has set some very, very brave targets for 2050, but there are players like Maersk that are going to need to make a technology decision and they've been very public in this open innovation by 2023 about what the new designs for their vessels will be. And I don't think we have to chase the silver bullet. I think we can see that there are a number of vessels and, and, and vehicles that will be able to work very well on electrification battery. Then there'll be a number of vehicles and vessels that will be able to work on uh, gaseous hydrogen. Then when we look at uh, deep sea and coastal uh, longer journeys, we need to have a bunker and methanol is a fuel used today on significant size vessels so it is a great part of that journey that you can utilize a liquid bunker in solution and you know you can build dual fuel engines that will be able to use 
the best of both types of, uh, of fueling technologies. And then ammonia uh, is a, another uh, solution that will deal with so deep sea. So, so I think the traction that we are seeing within the appetite from governments, from a regulatory push, but also from customers, but most importantly from the industry itself to want to look at new generational fuels, uh, methanol is going to be part of that solution. Okay, thanks, Damien. Uh, Yawa, just give me one sec. I have a lot of questions for you, but uh, I want to move on to Germany for a quick uh, update from uh, our gentleman from Germany. So um, last year, the German government um, came up with a legislatively binding uh, law that would uh, lead Germany towards uh, uh, climate mitigation strategies with a clear target as to uh, what the greenhouse gas reductions would be. And uh, and as uh, you might know, there is quite a lot of experience with using uh, methanol in um, different applications in Germany, be it in ships and cars, uh, different research projects, but also producing it from renewable sources in uh, through different pathways. What does this new uh, legislation say, uh, or how, do, how does this vote for uh, the future of renewable methanol uh, as as a fuel in 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 Germany? or maybe in, in, in Europe in general, but maybe let's focus on Germany first. Who starts? Tom, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. Sorry. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, certainly there's a huge, uh, I would say, a very uh, tangible government support for green hydrogen and power to X solutions in, in Germany. And that's been stated uh, explicitly and uh, in various industry groups, it's, uh, I would say, addressed at the highest levels of, uh, of large companies in Germany. Um, I think that we see here a preference for methanol, and uh, there are several reasons for this. So when we look at the different power to X solutions, we have ammonia, we have methanol, uh, methane, and fischer tropsch liquids. The, those which deal with carbon capture and utilization are obviously different here than uh, hydrogen storage uh, and let's say recovery of hydrogen after the fact. So when we look at carbon capture uh, and storage, it's it's not really feasible here in Germany. That's an important part of the legislative picture is that carbon capture and storage will not be done in Germany. So they will not be pumping carbon into the ground, which means that they have to do something with the carbon and ultimately have a circular carbon economy. So then if we say that we want to make carbon uh, uh, our carrier uh, and we want to use it for sustainable aviation fuels or marine fuels, then really we have then a choice of what to do. We can use a LNG, uh, we can use a methanol or we can try to make some kerosene via Fischer-Tropsch. Methane has implicit, uh, it, it has the advantage of being in a, a access to a huge uh, network of, of gas and, and this, um, but there is no liquid market for uh, for power-based methane, I would say. This is still a way off. And for me, methane is something which is much more for balancing variable and seasonable, seasonal uh, energy production. If we want to look at the production of fuels, then we're down to uh, methanol or artificial tropes liquids. And Methanol here is, as all of our colleagues here have mentioned, by far the cleanest approach to do so. And I would say the one which is the most technology ready in that you can take CO2, put it in traditional methanol process and there uh, receive a, a fuel which can be used directly or further upgraded by uh, dehydration to, uh, so methanol to olefins, olefins can be oligomerized to, to longer chain molecules. If you go through fischer tropsch this is a very much messier process, which I think was hinted at. And there is principally because of the phase, the, the multi-phasic approach for fischer tropsch where you have very many uh, phases, you have wax, you have uh, water, you have gas, and this creates a lot of process complexity and inefficiency. So methanol, everybody knows you, you can have a very high carbon efficiency. And I think that this is fundamentally why the German government will focus on on this technology because they recognize the advantages of the technology. Thanks, Tom. So, Stan, 
Same question, but I just want to have a different angle to it. So there was a question from the audience, which was um, methanol, be it uh, whether you produce uh, from renewable or non-renewable pathways, there is still that carbon element, right? Um, so can you sort of walk us through the process um, uh, based on the foundation of EU or German legislation, how they would recognize this um, circularity of uh, using carbon uh, produced from renewable sources and then also using that uh, fuel that's produced in, uh, say, for example, a car or a, a marine vessel? How does that work from a legal perspective? How do we uh, legitimize um, that this circularity that we are um, sort of creating by recycling carbon actually helps with uh, climate mitigation? Well, uh, everybody is free to produce uh, methanol from uh, CO2. And uh, uh, it's even a business case uh, 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 without the legislation in the European Union. Uh, most of the time, we want to be independent from any impacts. Uh, and uh, uh, ideally, uh, we should. Um, produce something and dig it in the ground because in the last uh, 200 years we have uh, done the opposite we have taken uh, fossil resources in the ground put them into the air uh, from the business case uh, as transport fuel um, uh, we focus uh, uh, being connected uh, directly to the power producer and what we see uh, now uh, is a big push uh, uh, from the legislation uh, uh, regarding the blending mandate and CO2 tax. In Germany, now uh, we discuss a 20% target, which is uh, higher than the 14% target of the European Union. And uh, next year, we will have uh, in place for the first time in Germany a CO2 tax on fuels. And uh, regarding so to say sustainability of the CO2 use, CO2 harms in, in any way. It, it doesn't matter if it's CO2 from biogenic source, or from the industry, from a power producer, uh, we must take the CO2 from the chimneys. That's clear. And uh, when we use it as fuel, we will, re we will release it again. But for the first time, we have a cascade use of CO2. And as transport fuel, we uh, replace the use of uh, fossil fuels so we can leave them in the ground. And this is the first step entering into a circular economy in the transport sector. Uh, what happens after 2050, I don't know. But this is the first step to install capacities of electrolyzers to get away from, so to say, uh, fossil uh, carbon-based industry. Uh, we have to start somewhere and we have the chance now to uh, use the C atom in a circular manner. Thanks, Stan. So, Yawa, I'll come back to you right now. Do we have a question from, from, from the audience? And this is really about um, the in intermittency of renewable power sources. And how does that factor in into the production of renewable methanol? How can we um, sort of um, have visibility on the reliability of uh, renewable sources and also utilizing that in, 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 uh, for the production of renewable methanol? How does uh, Hoddle Topso do it? Or uh, is there a way that you sort of uh, circumvent this problem? So, so what we would normally say is, <clears throat> uh, for the for the for the for the intermittent renewable like for for the feedstocks with intermittent renewable energy sources, we design our plant and process to take in all the you know the fluctuations around the power side uh, as well as on the CO2 side, which is much more stable. So we have we have the we have the synthesis section which is designed for that. Furthermore, our MK317 sustained catalyst is actually well, very well demonstrated and has the capability of uh, the highest mechanical strength that you could have in order to, to, to make sure 
that it takes in all the ramping up and ramping down of the of the of the front end feed that happens so we have uh, we have identified the sweet spot uh, what i would call as for designing these uh, methanol plant running on dynamic loads thank you just one more question here before i release you is uh, there's a question from the audience and they, they ask um how the topsoil has produced uh, methanol um from uh, bio sources as well as uh, utilizing renewable energy uh, in terms of efficiencies uh, which um, is more efficient which process would be more efficient in producing methanol uh, I, I, I would I would turn this question around I think so it's all about uh, what the other audience members have all, like the panelists have, have shared it's all about the energy need which which uh, renewable source, would enable to meet the energy need of the market. That's that's the equal, that that's how we would like to address it. So the bio will always uh, be uh, deficient on because there is not enough out there uh, on the bio level. Uh, kind of you know the bio feedstock available. Uh, so when it comes to comparing the efficiency of the two. It all depends on okay, what kind of process we are talking when it when we are talking about the bio feedstock. What's the cost of the? So it's all the all the economics uh, for the gasification part. The technology uh, is something that talks do not have it. But uh, if we want to make the bio process much more competitive, we're designing for the large scale capacities. We are developing uh, a technology around SMR, which is an electrifier. Uh, electrified steam reforming, uh, which would allow to design the loop in a conventional way as we do it, to gain the benefit of economy of scale for the large capacity plants. So if, if you talk today, uh, it's, it's all about which, it's all about the process that would determine uh, the lower cost of production per ton of methanol. Uh, and there are various studies that have been done in some, it would favor the bio process based on the uh, based on the location and the different dynamics. Whereas in some processes, it's the renewable that favors. Thanks, Yao. So next on, I'll move on to Tom. Tom, I just wanted to ask you uh, this question: in in light of uh, today's prices for conventional methanol, um, how would you factor that in uh, to your uh, the financial calculations that you showed uh, during your slide deck just now on uh, what uh, renewable methanol might look like. Uh, would it would it severely affect those uh, considerations or um, or you think that they still stand in today's uh, today's uh, depressed uh, price era? So I think that uh, renewable methanol and as well as advanced biofuels and, and methanol from uh, municipal solid waste Really struggles uh, to compete on a level, yeah, on a level playing field with the fossil methanol. I think that's clear. Mm -hmm. That uh, gas is, is so cheap, and uh, the methanol price tracks very closely the price of gas. Mm -hmm. it, it's certainly difficult to imagine that the economics would be favourable in that sense. Um, those mechanisms, and and where I believe Power to X has a has a chance is when there are either costs on the emission of CO2 where there are uh, very, very low energy prices and available renewable energy, or where there is a, a subsidy or an incentive for the final product. And so what we look at with methanol, I think is the need for a, a fluid market for renewable methanol, for bio-based uh, bio, uh, methanol. And this exists uh, in the European Union in the form of the advanced biofuels and we, are of the strong belief that there will soon be a mandate for, for power to X fuels, which will come in in the next uh, five years to increment uh, the, the contribution of renewable uh, fuels in, in this. And so that's a start, right? Because then we have the fuel market where methanol can directly enter as a blending, uh, as a blending component or can be upgraded. Um, where we would like to see it further are uh, areas of the chemical industry where, so we're looking for other legislation to to enable the case for, for methanol and other industries. But 
at the moment, I would say it exists for the fuel industry in the form of uh, the incentives and uh, in, in the Renewable Energy Directive. And I believe also in certain parts of the United States, there are incentives for uh, sustainable fuel markets as well. Thanks, Tom. So Stan, I will uh, give the second last question to you today. Um, and the question is, um, how do you see gray, blue, and green methanol uh, coexisting with uh, ammonia as we transition uh, or, or, or as we go through this energy transition phase? And uh, do you see um, the cost of uh, power to X decreasing over time? Uh, and I'm assuming uh, what was asked here is that the, the technological efficiencies would also uh, rise with the amount of money that's being pumped in by various governments and companies around the world. So what, do you, what, what is BSE's outlook uh, for, for, for this? Uh, gray, blue, green methanol in competition to ammonia. Would it, would, it, would it coexist or uh, I think well, by, by nature they're very different products, yeah? Well, uh, we have a demand of methanol. This is increasing globally and uh, in the European Union we import uh, methanol and we import natural gas. Uh, one uh, target here in Europe is to be more or less independent from uh, 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 external resources. And what are the resources that we have? It's green power and CO2, and we can utilize it. And uh, we also can uh, use uh, natural gas and pump uh, 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 the CO2 in the ground, use the hydrogen and make methanol. It doesn't matter. We have a, we have a demand of methanol. And it uh, is uh, already in place. And when we look uh, to the power-based methanol production, uh, we see a big leverage in the electrolyzers. This is the uh, major part of the capital costs and also in the uh, power price. But uh, already today we have achieved a reasonable level where we can produce uh, ma uh, renewable methanol competitive. Uh, uh, when we would uh, buy methanol at a gasoline station today, it would cost without tax roughly uh, 60 euro cents. Okay. Thanks, Stan. So we are running out of time, but uh, I want to give the last, I want to direct the last question to Damien. Uh, Damien, so uh, recently, or no, 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 not too recently, but um, it was just announced that Orsted and Maersk, uh, you guys, along with other companies, have uh, come together in a consortium to produce a renewable fuels in Denmark. Um, and I think one of the interesting things of having Orsted present today is um, that you are not um, from the chemicals industry. Um, how, what made you, um, or what convinced Orsted as a company to enter into this uh, collaboration? And because uh, I'm assuming that you guys do see a potential or a business case in producing um, renewable methanol uh, from, from excess wind power or existing wind capacities? What, what, what do you think about this? Yeah, um, so the what is exciting is that collaboration is driven uh, by industry. So uh, aviation, shipping and, and road transport want alternative fuels. Um, we, we are drawn into it because we are, you know, our journey to make offshore wind economic is a very similar journey to how we will make electrofuels economic. Um, the uh, cost reductions of what we see within the technology of electrolyzers, be it PEM or alkaline, what we see with the other panelists today in terms of bringing that down their, their technologies. Um, so it's very tangible now, um, and it's something that we could certainly look to be rolling out. Um, and so, you know, we are drawn into it by industry asking us to get involved. Um, we, we see transport fuel not having a silver bullet. And of course, when we talk about electrification, 
this is a continuation of electrification where we just can't use battery or electron. It needs to be converted into a molecule. Um, so we are excited by the industry. What we do know is in some of the areas, particularly aviation, you know, uh, pure methanol in its, in its, uh, as it is, is going to be going to be a challenge and it needs innovation from the industry itself to see how it can get, you know, uh, methanol to, you know, a kerosene type of fuel. But for shipping right now, um, we, we set a target for ourselves as, as, a, as a business to be net zero within our own ships by 2025, which is a pretty brave target. So when we look at how we can make that transition, you know, we can look at second generation, third generation biofuels, but we can also look at biogenic methanol. Um, we're also a, a producer of biomass within Denmark. A lot of our combined heat and power plant uh, are biomass, and there is a large CO2 stream um, that would be considered biogenic net zero that can be captured to, to develop that fuel. So the journey that we're on, particularly in the in that project that you talk about there, is we've got, I think it's the first of its kind for have so many players in in you know committed to make this happen, that that we will collaborate to look at how we can economically grow from a 10 megawatt electrolyzer to a 300 megawatt electrolyzer to a 1,300 megawatt electrolyzer, and in that journey that will help Denmark achieve its CO2 uh, ambitions. Uh, and we see methanol as a as a great way of displacing traditional fossil fuels, which means it becomes a low carbon uh, alternative. Thanks, Damien. So I'll quickly wrap up here today, and maybe I'll do it by addressing one of the questions um, that was from the audience, and that was on um, the fact that like um, the idea of using methanol or, or the idea of the methanol economy has been around for. A long period of time. I think maybe it was first mentioned in, um, uh, as this person mentioned, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, why, why, why has that not um, seemed to materialize over the last 20, 30 years? And uh, I think what we've been getting from our presenters today is that the circumstances are different now. Um, there is a real tangible effort to transition towards cleaner fuels or cleaner processes or increasing sustainability of business in general. Um, but then it comes from two sides. There, there are two sides to this equation. One is uh, government policy, which makes these alternatives viable on a commercial level. But on the other hand, it also requires business to pump in um, their resources, their time to sort of make the technology more efficient so that you can also drive the price lower. I mean, drive the price down. And as you drive the price down, then there will be a lesser reliance on government policies to prop up the commercial viability of these alternatives uh, as we moved into a low carbon or a carbon neutral uh, future. Uh, so I would like to thank all my presenters who are on the call today, as well as our participants. I know we've run over time quite a bit, uh, and we were not able to address all your questions. Um, do not worry. I do have your questions. I will be sharing them with the presenters and uh, uh, if possible, they would be able to get back to you regarding the questions that you've asked, but we were not able to address on the call today. So uh, once again, thank you everybody for joining the call. Uh, I look forward to uh, speaking and uh, hearing from you uh, during the next webinar that MI will organize. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Goodbye. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.